Chicago School of Education 2018 installment in the Wozniak Lecture. Established in 2009, this lecture series was created to honor the contributions of longtime educator and the founding dean of the Loyola School of Education, John M. Wozniak. His service to Loyola from 1959 through 1984 as educator, scholar, and mentor impacted many lives. In this spirit of dedication to the field, we are pleased to have you join us for this evening of engaging, thought-provoking examination and discussion on the topics of race, equity, and education. Our mission promises that every student in the school receives a transformative, urban-focused education in an academically rigorous environment with caring people committed to social justice. This mission is realized through our 40 different programs, exceptional faculty, talented staff, and a constant striving to engage students in applying theory to practice to become professionals in the Jesuit traditions of transforming our society through service, intellectual interrogation, and social justice. Our graduates are accomplished leaders in the fields of leadership, teaching, counseling, psychology, research methodology, and administration. This week saw the passing of Linda Brown. For those who may not know, in 1954, as a young schoolgirl, Ms. Brown was at the center of a landmark Supreme Court case, best known as Brown versus the Board of Education. This case is centered on dismantling decades of federal education laws that condone segregating schools for black and white students. While 1954 may seem like ancient history, I think we can all agree that there is still work to be done to improve equity in education for all. This day is not just a reflection of the passion that founded the school nearly 50 years ago, but the bright light that burns in the hearts and the minds of our full membership. As we turn our attention to our invited lecturer, Dr. Amanda Lewis, I thank you all for joining us as education professionals who are actively engaged in living the mission of social justice through education. Thank you. Hi, I'm not Amanda Lewis. <laughs> Welcome. Um, I'm Kate Philippa. I'm an associate professor in the School of Education. And um, I was honored with the opportunity to introduce Dr. Lewis to you So when I think of Dr. Lewis's work, I think of three things. Direct, unhesitating, and really thoughtful exploration of how race gets negotiated in everyday life in schools and universities. My new attention to interpersonal and organizational dynamics in schools that underpin the phenomena she studies. And writing that is clear and intellectually rigorous, like it's pulling us in and asking us to think the very best we can possibly think. Her work has found its way into my own courses on the sociology of education, race and schooling in the United States, and qualitative research methods. When it came time to nominate speakers for this year's Wozniak lecture, I knew exactly whom I hoped to invite, and here we are. It then came as no surprise to me that my colleagues sought her to join us this evening. Dr. Lewis is a local and national doctor in and beyond intellectual circles. She's a professor of African American Studies and Sociology at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And she's the author of two seminal books, Race in the Schoolyard, Negotiating the Color Line in Classrooms and Communities, and with John Diamond, the book Despite the Best Intentions, Why Racial Inequality Persists in Good Schools. Dr. Lewis also co-edited the books The Changing Terrain of Race and Ethnicity and Challenging Racism in Higher Education Promoting Justice. Her research has appeared in a number of academic journals, including Sociological Theory, the American Educational Research Journal, American Behavioral Scientist, Race and Society, the Du Bois Review, and Anthropology and Education Quarterly. Dr. Lewis also exercises her leadership leadership through the direction of the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy at UIC. IRRPP, and I was informed there isn't a shorter way to pronounce that that they've come up with yet, is an organization that facilitates policy-relevant research on matters of race, ethnicity, racism, and public policy. 
The Institute also assists with the recruitment and development of faculty and students of color at UIC, develops partnerships around policies and initiatives of advancement for communities of color. IRP, IRRPP conducts workshops for educators on advancing racial justice, prepares students and faculty to engage policy in their research on race, supports research on current and historical effects of race and racism in our city and in our country, and hosts a monthly interdisciplinary workshop of new and in progress <coughs> research on race, ethnicity, and public policy. I was so impressed, I joined a listserv, so I know all about what's going on over there. <laughs> Today, if you've been with us before now, a couple of the things that we've learned um, from Dr. Lewis are about the thoughtfulness with which she approaches her research with educators and young people around matters of race and equity. We've gotten from her the big picture of the important racial equity work that's being done by students and educators at Jenner Elementary, Ogden International School, and Evanston Township High School. I also have word that a few of our students have gotten some excellent career advice from her today. Whether they want it or not. <laughs> they want it or not. It wasn't coming for me. In short, you have before you a compassionate, unquestionably relevant, and exceedingly talented scholar who has agreed to help us learn and grow this evening. Let's give it up for Dr. Amanda Lewis. Thank you, Kate. That was very generous. Um, before I say anything else, I also want to thank what I now understand to be the committee, which is the group of people involved in planning all this, um, including Dean David Slavsky, Assistant Dean Nancy Wilbur, and everybody else. We had a lovely lunch today. Um, it's a big thanks to Bree Castro, who marshaled me around today and got some unrequested advice as part of the bargain. Um, hopefully, it'll be moderately helpful. Or they can ignore it. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to use this event this evening um, to uh, work through a bunch of ideas I've been struggling with for the last 20 years. I, I feel like none of the ideas ever go away. We're still kind of working through them all the time. Um, and um, I wanted to start by telling a little story about how I got to, into doing this work. Um, I promised those who came to the class or the master class or whatever was earlier on qualitative methods I wouldn't repeat myself. but. Um, I was not planning on being an academic. I, um, I backed into getting a PhD and I, I went that route because I was going to be an elementary school teacher. And um, when I started going into schools, you know, and doing all my student teaching placements, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, um, this was, a, you know, a long time ago. Um, I started seeing things and witnessing things and trying to make sense of things that didn't make much sense. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, one was um, an incident at an elementary school. It was a school that was about half black and half white, and it was early on in my student teaching placement, and I was talking to the principal and one of the teachers there and asking them about which kids had gotten referrals so far that year. Um, I wanted to know, you know, as a new teacher, you always want to know who, to, who might give you a hard time and try to map out the class. and. Um, Long story short, um, they were talking about the referrals were down for the year, and they were feeling good about that, and then when I asked who in the third grade classroom I was in, they named all and only the African American boys in the class. And what was noteworthy at that moment was not only that they didn't notice that this seemed like a success to them, but also that this was a class in which those African American boys couldn't have been more different. Um, there was Kenny, who was a lively, super bright, really engaged um, star of the class. There was Anthony, who had an IEP for some emotional challenges and was um, regularly doing his own thing, no matter what was going on in class. There was this um, Moses, who all he ever did was read. Even at recess, he would be sitting in a corner reading, and I couldn't understand at that moment what Moses possibly could have done to get referred to the classroom. Um, there were lots of moments like that um, when I was supposedly learning how to teach, in which I saw educators, really award-winning educators, doing things that seemed completely contrary to their values and intentions, um, and that went without notice on a kind of daily basis in schools. 
Another moment for me was when I was in a public school in Oakland, um, and this was a this was the teaching placement where I was supposed to learn something about bilingual education. It was a sheltered Spanish class, so it was a class that was supposed to be primarily students who were had Spanish as their first language, and it was a class that was half African American. Um, there was about a third of um, Southeast Asian immigrant kids. Um, you know, maybe two or three Latino kids. It was just all over the place. And trying to figure out what, you know, so I prepared these lessons that were supposed to be with one, and this other thing was going on. Why was this happening? Oakland the Unified School District lost their bilingual um, federal compliance soon thereafter. But there were these clearly big structural dysfunctions that were shaping school life that I was um, trying to make sense of. Um, and Third, and there are many I could narrate, tell me if that buzzing with the microphone gets too annoying, um, was just how vastly different the resources the schools I was in had. Um, so here again, as a new teacher trying to navigate the system, trying to make sense of what it means that we are offering kids such vastly different opportunities to learn, I did what I thought a good graduate student at the time did, which was I went to try to find things to read to explain all this to me. Um, and in fact, couldn't find what I needed. And that was why, with some really hard nudging from some people I was taking classes at the time, led me to go um, and have this other career. Um, at the time, I was mostly just frustrated and infuriated by what I saw. And now, I think hopefully most of the time I remain infuriated, but I have a better sense of what happened and what was going on, and hopefully by the end of this conversation tonight, we'll all sort of be down that road. Um, so, here are the big takeaways that I've learned over the last 20 years. I'm going to summarize them all in the next, how long do you want me to talk? Hopefully I will talk for more than 40 minutes, and, um, and then we can have a conversation. Um, so one of the things that I've been obsessing with about is how so many of the racial patterns we see in school, <laughs> I promise there's like 40 other slides, but I haven't even got them. They won't all be this long. Um, how many of the, so many of the racial patterns we see in schools today are similar to the ones we might have seen 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, and how important it is to understand what the mechanisms are now today that produce those realities and how they're different from what came before. But it is also hugely important, and I will probably make this point three times, to recognize that, that pa those patterns have always been there. So the mechanisms might be the same, but there was never any point in our history in which we said, oh yeah, we've had this long history of using schools as way to, to for mechanisms for social control and ways to reproduce hierarchy, and we did all that stuff, and now we're going to stop and we're going to make sure everybody has the same educational opportunities and start a whole new thing, right? That, that moment never happened. We are a constantly evolving um, system, and we have to remember our historical roots, partly because you can't understand some of the things today when we see, like, why are schools still organized on farm calendars and that sort of thing, without thinking about that, that long history. Anyway. So why does race matter in the classrooms? Here are some of the takeaways, and then I promise to get into it. Um, one, um, how racism works today is not the same as how it worked in the past. Um, it is often subtle, not so much maybe now as maybe a couple years ago. There's some, there's some you know, fluctuations we need to attend to. Um, but it is often unintentional, and especially in schools, it, it remains consequential. Um, I understand that the kind of pervasive racial dynamics we're going to be talking about today are often hard to address because of how people make sense of 